Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. I'm Ella Serpe. I lead the section on cellular communication in the Child Health and Human Development Institute. I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Susan Parkhurst, discussing a topic we can all relate to, wound repair. She has inspired generations of women scientists, and today Susan is the guest of WSA, Women Scientist Advisors Committee. I too have been a fan of Susan's work for a long time. Her research brought key advances to many topics in modern biology, including mechanisms of transcriptional repression, nuclear organization, cellular signaling, and the biology of the cytoskeleton. She was always after mechanisms, fundamental science that makes a difference because as Susan put it, you cannot make medical advances if you don't know the basis. Susan is a professor in the basic science division at the Fred Hodge Cancer Research Center in Seattle and an affiliate professor with the Department of Biology, University of Washington. She received both her undergrad and PhD degrees in biology at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. She had a postdoctoral fellowship at the Imperial College Cancer Research Fund in London with Dr. S. Horowitz, uh, followed by a research fellowship at Caltech with Dr. Howard Lipschitz. Susan jo uh, joined Friend Hutch in 1992 and rose up the ranks to become a full professor in 2000. At the heart of her current research is the study of the cytoskeleton, a structure that helps cells maintain their shape and provide mechanical support for a wide range of cellular function, from cell division to cell migration and metastasis. Susan is especially famous for her contribution to wound healing because she had really defined the field by using Drosophila as the first genetic model to dissect the molecular and cellular mechanism underpinning the wound repair process and its implication for diseases such as cancer when the process goes awry. Her work had, has beautifully visualized cytoskeletal dynamic during development, as well as during wound repair, defining signaling centers, such as raw GTPases, that modulate cytoskeleton dyna dynamics, and effectors downstream them, such as wash proteins that bundle actin, bundle microtubules, and cross-link them together. Along the way, Susan has picked up numerous honors, and this includes being a named Pew Scholar in the Biomedical Sciences and the Leukemia Lymphoma Society Scholar. She is an amazing and widely creative scientist, but also a generous and a thoughtful citizen beyond her institution, serving continuously in NIH study section and advisory boards within the Genetic Society. The title of her talk is Wound Repair, Dealing with Life's Little Traumas. Susan, welcome to the NIH. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to start by saying thank you to Ella and to the Women's Advisory um, Committee for this invitation. I'm really excited to be able to share our work on, on wound repair with you today. It turns out that wounds can happen in response to many different things. For example, da daily wear and tear in terms of trauma, through chemicals or other environmental stresses or through clinical interventions. And so a, an organism needs to have a way to respond very quickly. Um, not only does this happen um, at a single cell level, but it happens at a, a multicellular level and at an organismal level. And there are differences in these different types of wound repair as to what kind of mechanisms you use. And it turns out that you can use model organisms to study all of these different events, and they're remarkably similar to what happens in humans. Uh, my lab has done a number of these, but what I'm going to do today is focus on this stage, what happens to single cells. So it turns out every um, cell in your body is subjected to daily wear and tear, to environmental stresses, physiological stresses, and they have to be able to um, fix any kind of membrane breaches. And so, for example, if you walk down a hill, you're ripping open muscle cells, and you have to be able to repair those cortex, uh, cell cortexes because you can't replace every muscle cell. And so in order to do that, you need to have a process that's going to happen very quickly. And there have been a number of different organisms and uh, systems that have been developed to look at single cell repair, and all of them share a lot of features. And what I'm showing you here are sort of the physiological features that we know happen no matter what system you're looking at. So if you look here, you have a membrane and a cortical cytoskeleton. And when you breach this cortex, calcium is thought to flow in. 
It changes the microtubules and actin cytoskeleton to direct it towards the wound, and it will bring vesicles to the surface. And those vesicles will, will fuse with each other and with the plasma membrane. And in doing so, they plug the wound. Then you have the formation of an actin myosin ring here that's going to pull the wound closed and the, the cortical cytoskeleton along with the overlying membrane. And once the wound is closed, then it has to remodel. So you need the membrane and the underlying cortical cytoskeleton to go back to its normal composition and organization in order to carry out its normal functions. And so while we know the general um, cell biological aspects of what happens in wound repair, what we don't know are the molecular underpinnings. So we don't have a really good molecular pathway in, in any of these organisms for what happens, like what's a start signal? How do you know what different molecules are required throughout these different steps? And how you know, for example, that you finished and so that you don't over repair. So in, in my lab, we use Drosophila as a model organism. And it turns out that there's a fluke of, of Drosophila development in these very early stages where you have nuclear divisions, but with no cell divisions. So in the center of the, of the egg, you have the nuclei divide. And it's not until later that they move out to the surface and become cells. So during this early stage, they're essentially a big cell, a multinucleate cell, but a very large cell. And a lot of the, the cells in the body that are undergoing repair, such as muscle cells and gut cells, are multinucleate. So these turn out to be a very good system for that. So what we've tried to do using this as a model is to take sort of two really basic kind of approaches. One is a global approach and to use the advantage that Drosophila is a genetic organism and you can do genetic screens. And what that allows you to do is to generate collections of mutations that affect wound repair and be able to look at the collection as a whole to get the general principles of what's going on to figure out what happens first, what happens second, what happens third, and to start to build a pathway. And you can do this using genetic screens. And because Drosophila is very amenable to imaging, you can also use visible screens. Um, we can also look at specific points in the pathway. So if we want to know like what is a start signal, we can design experiments to look during the earliest stages and ask what's required then. So we can look for different um, events like start signals, stop signals. We can also ask what the role of any given family of proteins is. So different cytoskeletal proteins or membrane proteins and ask how they, they work in, in wound repair. And we, we do both of these and I'm gonna give you examples of both. <clears throat> Before I do that, I just wanna explain more about our system and what you, what you can expect to see. So this would be a Drosophila embryo. Um, it's surrounded by an impermeant vitellin membrane. Um, so you have the embryo, there's, there's a space here, a perivitellin space that's filled mostly with extracellular matrix. Um, and what we do when we image these, <clears throat> sorry, is to take a cover slip and put glue on it and then glue the embryo down. But what's actually being glued is the vitellin membrane. So the embryo is free to rotate inside here. And we image from the bottom. And what we can see is here, this is a, just a straight on view of the, the cell surface. And if we were taking um, slices going into the, the cell, and so if we cut it here and look at it from the internal view is what you're seeing here or here. So you can see what's happening at the surface, but also what's happening below the surface as well. And so we can do these time-lapse images and look for any particular molecule. So this is showing an actin reporter for what happens during the repair process. Okay, so <clears throat> while we do this in movies, it's really difficult to show these and compare them in any kind of way. So what we do to do that in a, in a talk or in a paper is to make a chymograph like this. So what we're doing is to take each individual image I show you here, take a small strip and line it up over time like this. And then by doing so, we can see, <clears throat> sorry, the, the um, closure of the wound. So if we're looking straight on, we can see that, for example, actin is accumulating very, very highly at the edge of the wound, and we call this the actin ring. It also accumulates at a, a higher level than normal, but not as high as the ring, and we call this an actin halo. And when we look uh, in a, this chymograph, we can see the first thing that happens is a wound expands, then it's going to generate this actin ring, which will help it close. 
And once it's completely closed, it has to disassemble this actin ring and then spends time remodeling the, the membrane and the underlying corticals, cytoskeleton. Okay, so as I said, we've, we've taken two different kinds of approaches. And from our global approach, we've done two different kinds of screens. One is a, we call a microarray screen. And, and the purpose of this was to try and identify genes that were up and down regulated in response to wounding. And our hope was that we would be able to identify start signals. Because, um, and then the, a flytrap screen, this is one where we're tagging proteins with GFP. And what we're looking is to see proteins that are recruited to a wound or that might be depleted upon wounding. Okay, I'll start with the, the microarray screen. So what we did here, and, and I'll just age myself a little bit here. The reason that it's a microarray screen is because we started it a while ago. If we were doing it today, it would probably be an RNA-seq screen, but it worked equally well to an RNA-seq screen. So um, if we take the embryo and we wound it, so in this case, we're wounding it eight separate times. And we have to do that so that we can get a robust enough response for wound repair so that when we look at the um, differences in transcription, we can actually uh, tell them. So we take embryos that are not wounded, embryos that are. We isolate RNA, make cDNA from them, and put them onto a microarray. And the microarrays that we were using in this particular case had 12,000 cDNAs from Drosophila on it. And that covers about 60% of the fly genes. We also did two time points. So we wanted to know uh, if transcription was involved in a start signal. And the reason for this is, is some of the experiments in tissue culture cells had suggested that when calcium flows into the cell, that it sets off a transcriptional ca cascade starting with AP1. And the sort of quandary that we had is that in the Drosophila early embryo, almost all of the um, events are run off of maternally contributed RNAs and proteins. You don't really get zygotic transcription until um, an hour after the time that we're using these embryos. So there's very little transcription at this time. I mean, not, there's not zero, there's a little bit, but not very much. So we either had to have a situation where in Drosophila, the start signal wouldn't be transcriptional, or we can induce a transcriptional signal in an embryo that normally isn't highly transcriptional. So we were interested in knowing which one that was, um, as well as what transcription was doing in general for, for wound repair. So that was the reason for doing two different time points. The, the early time point, the one at five minutes, which is about as fast as we can wound them, get them off the slide and, and analyze them, um, which should tell us anything that's happening immediately. So if there's um, a, a start signal, we should be able to detect it. We did it at 30 minutes. So the, the movies I showed you where they're repairing, that takes about 30 minutes in, in our case. So we wanted something at the end, and that would tell us everything that was required from a transcriptional point of view throughout the whole process. And then we have you know, a very large number of RNA lines that have been generated by the fly community that we can use to validate these. Okay, so what happened? These are volcano plots showing you the, the early time point and the late time point. The black dots that are here are all of the genes that are on the, the chip that are not changing. And the red and the green are the ones that are either down-regulated or up-regulated. And what you probably have noticed right away is that in this one, there are no red and green. So in the early, early time point, there were no transcriptional responses, either up or down. But by 30 minutes, there's a number of genes that, that are either up or down-regulated. Um, so that suggested to us that, consistent with the fact that in the early embryo, there's not a lot of transcription, that in fact, the, the early response is probably not transcriptional. But to confirm that a little bit further, what we did was to use um, inhibitors of transcription and look to see what happens to wound repair. Okay, so this is the chymograph I showed you and it's showing you a wild type embryo. And this is an actin reporter and you get uh, repair at about 15 minutes and then all the remodeling takes all the way till about 30. If you look at an embryo that's been injected with alpha amanitin, we can see that overall wound repair looks pretty similar. There is a little bit of difference at the beginning where you don't get an actin ring that's as robust as you see here, and it takes longer for it to close and then start to remodel. So it has phenotypes, but most of them are actually later than the, what you might expect for the initiation of transcription. 
Uh, we've also at the same time did ones for translation because a lot of the early embryo in, in the fly has proteins and RNAs there that need to be translated. So we use pyromycin or cyclohexamide. And what we found is that we do see differences from the very earliest stages, the wound repair is disrupted. So it suggests that, that at least in the Drosophila system, the early signals are, are more translationally um, established than transcriptionally. And that was a little bit of a surprise to us because translation takes some amount of time. And as you're probably appreciating, this whole process at 30 minutes is very, very fast. But it seems like the embryo is able to do that pretty well. Um, if we looked at the later time point, just to ask what effect does transcription have in the end? So we know that there are downregulated and upregulated genes. What we did was to map these onto chromosomes of Drosophila. So Drosophila has an X, two arms of the second, two arms of the third, and a really tiny fourth chromosome. And what you're seeing here, the black is euchromatin and um, heterochromatin. All of the gray dots are the cDNAs that are represented on the cDNA or on the microarray. So they're pretty evenly distributed amongst the chromosomes. And the red and the green are the up and down regulated genes. And just by looking at it, we didn't see any regions where uh, wound repair genes are clustering. So it didn't look like there were any kind of, of regions that were like that. Um, we also took all of these up and down regulated genes and mapped them to transcriptional activation domains that have been assigned to different regions of the chromosome and could find no um, TADs that were, lo that were um, specifically um, enriched for wound repair genes. So it doesn't look like there's a region that needs to be uh, established. And also taking all of these genes that are up and down regulated and looking for any kind of motif that's in them that would define them as a wound repair gene um, didn't yield any, any motifs. So we don't, we don't see that, that we're having a wound repair program per se, but you, what you have are a lot of genes that are required that get up or down regulated. Um, one, one interesting that, thing that we did find, however, is that the sizes of genes varied. So, the average size of a gene in a Drosophila embryo at this stage is about 2 kb. And if you remember, this, this is because the very, very early um, divisions are just the nuclear ones, and those are happening every 10 minutes. So the, the cell cycle is very, very rapid. And in that time, you don't really have time to, to transcribe very large genes. So most of the genes that are transcribed in the limited transcription that happens are very small and they usually don't have introns. So roughly two and a half KB. What we found is that the ones that were downregulated were sort of in the same range, 2 KB, 2.5 K, KB. So the downregulated genes uh, appear to be regu uh, recognizing mostly genes that are present in the embryo that get depleted. So they're being used for wound repair and depleted and not re remade. We did however find that the upregulated genes could be quite large. And when we look at some of these, we find that these are genes that are not normally expressed in the early embryo. So it says that the, the embryo is able to turn on dormant genes that it needs to activate in order to start the repair process. Um, if we look at the different genes that we got, so we, we took the top 15 upregulated and the top 15 downregulated and just asked, do they really affect wound repair? So here's a control with an actin reporter showing it close. And what you can see is that in these different mutants, you have phenotypes. Ones that, that um, disassemble the actin ring early, so they prematurely disassemble it, or they um, aggregate actin in the middle of the wound. They can overexpand the wound, or they can fail to disassemble the actin ring and keep it together forever, or stay open forever. Right, so we could see that all of these different genes were affecting wound repair. So we know that transcription is playing an important role, but just not in the initial stages of wound repair. And we can, we can measure all of these. So we can take the different phenotypes that we have and we can do uh, analysis of these. So this just shows you a control here. And if we look at all of the different genes or well, the 15 top upregulated or the 15 downregulated, we can find genes, for example, here we're looking at con the contraction rate, so the slope of the line as it goes down, and we can find genes that, um, like these or these, that, that will heal faster or slower. So by measuring 
the expansion rate, the contraction rate, whether they disassemble their, their um, actin ring, we can make sort of a, a combinatorial model of the different gene products that we have and what kind of processes they affect. And that lets us take this large group of genes that we've identified and start to place them into a molecular pathway and understand what, what are the different events and what types of genes you need in order to um, carry out those processes. Um, when we were doing this, we found one really interesting set of genes, and that had to do with insulin signaling. And what I'm showing you here is a very, very simplified model of insulin signaling, where you have insulin binding to the receptor and then setting up a cascade of different um, signaling events that will eventually lead to um, effector proteins being expressed. And we identified ones from the top of the pathway to the bottom of the pathway. Um, and it made us wonder if canonical insulin signaling was involved in cell wound repair. And that was a little bit surprising to us because um, you can imagine that you could have insulin signaling when you have multicellular repair or tissue repair where you're signaling from one cell to another. But in this case, when you're looking at a single cell and you have insulin signaling, it would mean that you would have to basically have a cell secrete insulin and take it up again, right? The same cell, so you're having autocrine signaling. And the question would be why to do that if you have to have a very rapid event, wouldn't it be easier just to signal within the cell and not have to signal out and then signal back in? Um, so we, we did look to see if the canonical pathway was being involved here. So um, PIP3 um, GFP is one of the reporters that people use to look at insulin signaling pathway. And what we can see is I'm showing you um, actin that's recruited to a wound, and this, this is double labeled with PIP3 GFP, and you can see that PIP3 GFP is also recruited to the wound, right? So it would suggest that, that at least this canonical pathway is, is intact and it's being used. Um, if it's really this pathway, though, what we would expect is if we were to knock out one of these upstream factors, that this would no longer be recruited. And that turns out to be the case. So if we knock out Chico, which is here, now we don't turn on the rest of the insulin signaling pathway. And you can see that while PIP3 is here, it doesn't accumulate at a wound. So again, it suggested that it really was the canonical um, insulin signaling pathway that was occurring here and not, not some extra pathway or moonlighting. Um, so what we did is to look for reagents that existed for all these different factors and ask what the phenotype was. So all of the ones that are circled in red are ones that we have RNAi lines for and could knock down and ask, do they have an effect on wound repair? And these are just the different um, chymographs showing the phenotypes. And these phenotypes are remarkably similar for all of these different factors, right? Where you see overexpansion, internal actin accumulation, et cetera. So it's, it suggested to us that indeed it is really the canonical insulin signaling pathway that's being involved here and that you have to have some type of autocrine signaling. Um, the fact that it was affecting this reporter, which is an actin uh, reporter, um, suggested to us that, that it must be affecting actin in some way. And when we looked at the downstream effectors that are known for insulin signaling, there are at least um, a couple of them that affect actin. And we looked at two of these, and those are shown here. So there's Gurdon. This is a, a protein that can bind to actin filaments as in a substrate for AKT. We also looked at chickadee, and this is the Drosophila ortholog of proflin, and this is known to bind to actin monomers. And what I'm showing you here is, is an embryo that's been um, wounded, so here you can see the, the wound for actin. And if you look at Gurdon, you can see that it's accumulating at a wound, and so does proflin into the center of a wound. And if you knock down the pathway with Chico, as we did before, this, this accumulation is lost, right? So both of these factors are acting downstream of the insulin signaling pathway. Um, one thing that was curious to us though is that the pattern of these are not the same. So the way that Gurdon is recruited to a wound, the way that proflin is, is not the same. Um, and that also is reflected in their mutant phenotypes. So this just shows you knockdown of Gurdon. So these are the XY views and then the chymograph. This is um, for proflin. In this case, we can't completely remove the gene, but we can reduce it significantly. Um, if we remove it, we don't recover embryos to look at. And you can see that there are differences. If you start with the graph, you can see that this one overexpands a little bit compared to this one and is delayed in, in closing, whereas this one isn't. 
um, we can see different accumulations of actin and, and phenotypes associated with staying open and, and disassembling the actin ring. So they're not doing exactly the same thing. And what that's led us to is a model um, for how this might work in, in single cell repair. So what I'm showing you here is this would be the embryo. This is that impermeant vitellin membrane that surrounds the embryo, and this is the extracellular space. What happens when we're wounding is we're, we're breaching the embryo cortex and you get an influx of calcium. And this will cause many things to happen, but one of the things that induces is exocytosis. And one of the things that's exocytosed is insulin-like peptide, which is the insulin in flies. This can then bind to the insulin receptor. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna bind um, to different affinities from, with the receptor as it's different distances from the wound. And in doing so, it's gonna set off a, a transcriptional, or sorry, a, a cascade, which will turn on one of these downstream factors. And they'll be different depending on the distance of the insulin receptor from the wound and the affinity of the insulin for that signaling process. And that turns out to be really important because as I showed you, right around the, the wound, you have an actin ring, and then you have a lower level of actin, but still accumulation in actin halo. And those are different architectures of actin. They require different um, ways in which the actin assemblies are put together. And these different factors are known to assemble actin in different ways. So one of the advantages then to signaling out and signaling back in, even if it takes a little bit longer, is to be able to turn on very precise genes that would give you different assemblies in different regions from the wound and allow you to um, close a wound. And so we're doing more work on this to try and understand exactly how those are working together. Okay, so if I, if I just summarize what, what the microarray screen told us, um, it told us that the initiation of the repair response, at least in Drosophila, requires translation rather than transcription although you do need transcription for the later events of, of wound repair. It also gave us 253 genes that are involved in cell repair between the up and down regulated ones. And we've only looked at a, at a handful of those so far, 15 up and down regulated ones. But even from that small subset, we've already identified insulin signaling as being re required to regulate actin dynamics in this process. And so we have now a number of other ones to, to look at that are gonna help us build this sort of molecular pathway that we're trying to do. Okay, so I will just briefly tell you about the other screen that we did. This is a GFP um, uh, tagged screen. So what we're doing is to tag pro or taking proteins that are already tagged by the, the community and asking if they're recruited or depleted upon wounding. And what I'm showing you here are just some examples. So we had 1,400 lines that had been generated in the Drosophila community where GFP had tagged a particular protein. And from this 1,400, we identified 141 lines that are recruited to wounds. And so what I'm showing you here, these, this is the actin uh, reporter, shows you what the wounds look like. So the wounds are pretty similar. And the green is, is what we call the fly trap. So this is the GFP that's, uh, that's fused to the protein of whatever, I mean, there are 1,400 different proteins here. And you can see that, for example, this one and this one are in the plug region. And so if you look at the actin ring, you can see they fill the space in between, which is where the membrane plug would be. And in this case, it's actually depleted from the area where the ring is. You can see ones like this where it forms a ring, but this ring is actually completely inside the actin ring. Or you can have ones that form a ring that are overlapping with the actin ring. This one forms a ring in a halo, or this one's just a halo. So we get a number of different patterns and we can look at these to see like what type of structures these things are affecting. We also get, um, in addition to the spatial kind of, of aspect, a temporal one. So here I'm showing you two examples where you have um, an embryo when it's wounded will accumulate uh, its GFP associated protein either very early and be gone later, or it doesn't really come up till the later stages. So by looking at these genes and looking at where they affect the different parts of the, the wounding pattern they affect and the timing, we can also use this to establish a pathway, what acts first, what acts second, and exactly what kind of, of feature they're having. Okay, so from the, the flytrap screen then, well, we can, we've identified 141 proteins 
And it's giving us a, a pretty good view of what's happening at different times in the, in the repair process. All right, so this is sort of our, our global approach using flies as a genetic system to be able to get collections of proteins and look at the genes as a collection to understand sort of the global uh, underpinnings of, of the molecular pathway. Another thing that we can do with this model though is to look at specific things. And we can look at specific events or specific molecules. So if we wanna look at start signals, stop signals, or, or like the remodeling of the cortex, we can look at those different um, events and ask what's required. But we can also look at different families of proteins and ask, for example, what do road GTPases do? Or what do um, annexins do? Or any different set of molecules that we might be interested in looking at. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how we were able to do that and the kind of things that we're learning. So I'll start with uh, row GTPases. So these are, are you know, classic molecules that, that are known to affect the actin cytoskeleton. So th this is, shows you row that they cycle between a GDP bound state and a GTP bound state. And in their GTP bound state, they combine to effector proteins and then carry out a number of different events that are all um, the, the underlying theme is that they affect trans, uh, cytoskeletal regulation. So work that had been done in Xenopus oocytes looking at cell repair had shown that, that the three major row family GTPases, which are row RAC and CDC42, are involved in wound repair and that they form concentric rings around the wound. So this just shows you actin and row, CDC42 and row, and then just CDC42 and row. So rho is, is in a ring right at the edge of the, the wound. And you can see a concentric ring. This is CDC42 on the outside. Um, they hadn't done RAC, so they don't know what RAC is doing in this particular case. But what they, they um, showed is that these proteins are, are forming these different um, regions and they're affecting actin polymerization and depolymerization. So in this case, um, what they're looking at is of these, what these reporters are showing them are activated Rho and activated CDC42. And what Rho is doing is causing actin to be polymerized. So if this is an actin ring, the Rho is on the inside causing more actin to be polymerized. CDC42 on the outside does the opposite. It asks for, for uh, actin to be depolymerized or, or disassembled. So the way that this ring will get smaller, so the way that it's going to translocate inward is by continuously polymerizing actin on the inside and depolymerizing it on the outside, right? As opposed to contracting in, in, a, um, in some kind of, of a mechanical contractile form. And they know that because if they were to inhibit myosin, either using um, a chemical inhibitor, Y27632 or blevastatin, this process will still proceed. Right, so, so you don't need myosin for this to happen, but what they call this is actin treadmilling. Right, so you have actin that's, that's forming here. When it disassembles, it can move to the inside and form new actin. And that will allow the, the cytoskeletal to close and it will pull the membrane with it. So we wanted to see if the Drosophila system was doing exactly the same thing or not. And so we looked to see if Rho, RAC, and CDC42 are called to wounds, and it turns out they all are. Um, if you co-localize with actin, you can see that this one, that row is actually inside the ring, whereas RAC is overlapping the ring, and CDC42 overlaps the ring as well and, and gives more of a halo region. And what I'm showing you here is just a, a graphical representation of what's happening here. So if here's the wound and here's the actin ring and halo, row is actually mostly inside the wound, and you have a higher amount of CDC42 and RAC in the wound. Um, this tapers off, whereas this stays more consistent into the halo region. And this was, this was interesting. And what we wanted to know was um, how it was being, uh, what it was doing in terms of, of actin regulation, if it was acting the same as in Xenopus or not. Um, so one major difference that we found is that if we were to treat Drosophila embryos with myosin inhibitor, so Y2763, then wound repair in our case stops dead in its tracks, right? So in our case, the actin ring is contractile. Right? So that, that was very interesting in terms of, of row family GTPases. So these row family GTPases in the Xenopus system are using the same downstream molecules to, to carry out the same kind of role. They're um, closing a wound, 
but they're doing it through a different mechanism than Drosophila are doing. So in one case, you need contraction. In the other case, you need treadmilling. And we've used this system now to look downstream at effectors and ask what types of things are doing. And we can assign different downstream effectors to different parts of the wound repair pathway. Or in some cases, we know different parts of the pathway, but we don't know what the, the downstream effectors are yet, but we know they're not these. Um, and we're continuing to do this, um, but we also wanted to start looking upstream and ask, how do we regulate these GTPases? Because um, it's, it's a little bit interesting when you, because it's thought that the initial signals coming in are very uniform. And what we're seeing here are concentric rings of GTPases. So we know that directly upstream of rogue GTPases are rogue GEFs and GAPs. And so we thought we would have a look at these and see if they were uh, responsible for giving you this uh, break in asymmetry. Uh, so Drosophila has a number of rogue Fs, like I think more than 20, but only three of them are called to wounds. And that's the three that are shown here. So rogue F2, rogue F3, and pebble. And you can see that their patterns are different. Rose, rogue F2 is just a, a ring, pebble's a halo, and rogue F3 has a little bit of both. And if I put that with actin as well, you can see, again, this is inside the ring, this is overlapping the ring, and this is outside the ring. So if we do our graphical model, the GEFs would look like this compared to the GTPAs as I showed you earlier. So we wanted to get, so, I mean, they're patterned. So we already see a pattern in row GEFs that, that we see in, in GTPAs. And we wanted to know what the relationship is then between the GEFs here and the GTPAs. And one way we can do that is to knock out the GTPAs is, or the, the GEFs and ask if the GTPAs is, are recruited. And I'll show you an example of that um, here. So this is, this is row one recruitment in a wild type embryo. And if you remove GEF2, what you find is that row is no longer recruited. But if you remove the other GEFs, pebble or row GEF3, you now see recruitment of row. Right. This pattern is not normal because removing these affects the actin cytoskeleton, but they are being recruited. So that means that rogue F2 is responsible for recruiting rho. And we can do the same thing by removing uh, the same um, GEFs and looking at RAC and CDC42. And when we do that, what we find is that rogue F2 looks like it's needed to recruit rho. Pebble is needed for CDC42 and rogue F3 is needed for RAC. So we get something that looks something like this. So there seems to be more or less a one-to-one -one correspondence in this case um, in terms of the rogue F and the rogue GTPAs. And that made us go back and refine our question a little bit because we wanted to know how these were patterned relative to each other, how you got the concentric rings. And it turns out these are just responding to the GEFs that are regulating them. So we now go up a, a step and say, okay, if this is the pre-pattern that's set, how do we um, get this to, to come out in a pattern? So the other thing I'll point out is that this is happening at about 30 or 45 seconds after we, repair, we wound, whereas this is happening at 10 seconds to 15 seconds after we wound. So whatever is working upstream here has to be doing it in less than 10 seconds. Um, so this is where we took advantage of the screens that we did, and we went back to our flytrap screen and said, okay, out of the genes that we identified, how many of them are recruited in less than 10 seconds? And there are a couple of them that are, and this just shows you two of them. So there's one that's called an XNB9, and it's recruited at three seconds. And this is another one that's called flytrap 74, and it's recruited in a very weird pattern, but, but at three seconds. So we started to look at, at annexin B9. And the reason for this is that annexins are a family of proteins that are known to stabilize actin. Um, they also respond to calcium, which is what we think is the, the inward flow as soon as you uh, rupture a wound or a cortex. And in other systems of wound repair, like tissue culture cells, annexins have been implicated in some of the later steps, but in the, in the repair process at least. Okay, so what we, we what we would hypothesize then is that if an XNB9 was required to regulate rogue Fs, then their recruitment to wounds should be disrupted in an XNB9 mutant, 
just the same way as rho GTPAs are, are, mutant, are sorry, affected by GEFs. So we looked in that case and we said, okay, in wild type, rho GEF2 can be recruited to a wound. And in an XMB9 mutant, it's not, right? So that would say that you need um, an XMB9 in order to get rho GEF2. If you look at GEF3 and Pebble, you find that they are recruited to wounds still. So you don't need an XMB9 for those. So if we look, it would say that an XMB9 is just upstream of rho GEF2, which we know is already upstream of rho GEF1. Okay, so the next question we wanted to address then is, since annexins are known to regulate actin stabilization, is it in some way affecting actin stabilization? And that's its mechanism of action in this pathway. And what we did was to, in, to disrupt actin by injecting latrunculin B. And what latrunculin does is it depolymerizes actin that exists. And this shows you that. So if you inject lab B, you can see actin is disrupted and rho GEF2 is not recruited to a wound anymore. The next in B9 though is, so if you do latrunculin injections, you can see actin is disrupted, but an XMB9 has no problem getting to a wound, right? So it, it doesn't need that kind of actin in order to get to a wound. And that suggests that an XMB9 could be doing something to actin, which then is required for real GEF2 to, to show up and, and um, accumulate at a wound. So the way that we wanted to test this was to say, if we were to take an annexin B9 mutant where rho GEF2 is not recruited, and we were to stabilize actin by some means other than annexin B9, we might be able to bypass that requirement here and be able to go on with the pathway. And so what we did then is to inject phylloidin. And phylloidin will stabilize actin in whatever form it is. And then we can ask what happens. So we're taking this exact mutant, annexin B9, where rho GEF2 is not accumulating and injecting um, phylloidin. And now what you see is rho GEF2 can be recruited, right? So it really suggests that what an XMB9 is doing is stabilizing actin. So this just summarizes what I'm telling you. An XMB9 can stabilize actin that will allow rho GEF2 to be recruited and rho one will follow that pattern. Um, so that's great in terms of this pathway. Um, it doesn't really tell us what's going on over here. Um, but what I didn't really tell you in the beginning is that while annexin B9 was part of our flytrap screen, um, there are actually three annexins in, in flies. And um, this is just saying that there are two different actin things. Uh, there are three annexins in flies. So there's also an annexin B10 and an annexin B11. Um, there are no GFP constructs or RNAi constructs for these when we started. So we generated those. We could ask if maybe these were having an effect on, on the other two rho GEFs. Okay, so the first thing we did is look at their expression. So this is an XN B9, which I've already showed you in response to wounding. This is B10 and this is B11. And what you probably are already realizing is that we have the same pattern cropping up again. These are pattern and they're forming concentric rings. Um, so we're not really catching a break yet in terms of what's going from the asymmetric or, or the, the, the symmetric sorry, the symmetric initial response to the asymmetry that we're seeing here. But these are patterning in that really early time point. So if we come back to this then, we know that the GEFs are patterned and now we know that the annexins are patterned. So the GEFs are really responding to the pattern that's already being set by the annexins. And that made us go back to what we know about the very beginning of this pathway where there's a calcium influx. And we wanted to go back and ask, is that really an, a symmetric signal or, you know, or is it asymmetric and from the very beginning? And so we used a G-CAMP reporter. This is an unwounded and an, a wounded embryo. And you, this is just shows you where the wound is. You can see that the response is uniform over this whole area. So the initial response is uniform and within three seconds, you're seeing a pattern response. Uh, so that means that we still have another step here that we don't know what it is, um, but a lot less seconds to figure it out in. Um, so we're going back to our, our screen with uh, fly traps and trying to look at some of the other ones that are 
recruited to a wound in less than 10 seconds and ask if we can find what is responding to calcium that then patterns these in such a short time. And one of, one of the ideas that we had is that this was in some way affecting lipids uh, because all of these are um, membrane bound. So they're, they're meristillated and inserted into membranes and they have preferences for certain lipids. And we thought perhaps what calcium influx could do would be to alter the lipid composition right around a wound and, and uh, that would automatically cause these things to be segregated to particular regions. Um, that turns out not to be the case. There, there are some um, regions that we see where there's uh, accumulation of particular lipids, but it doesn't account for this type of, of asymmetric pattern. So we're still stuck with what, what exactly is this question mark and what's, what's causing it. Um, and one thing that I'll show you is that as we're doing these studies, we end up finding out many other things as well. And this is just to show you what happens when we were imaging. So this is an embryo. And I'll just remind you that we have an embryo that's encased in a vitellin membrane. We're gluing it to a cover slip and imaging it from below. And if it's all behaving properly, this is what you see with an actin reporter. However, sometimes when you do this, this is what happens. So because the embryo is not tethered, it's inside this vitellin membrane, it can actually move around. And that's what you're seeing here, it moves around. And from a, a wound repair analysis point of view, this is really a pain because things are not in the right place. You can't get the movies that I showed you because they're moving all over the place and it's hard to do any kind of measurements. But sometimes you get lucky. So this embryo happened to be double labeled. So not only did it have actin, but it also had an XNB9 in green. And when we imaged this, this is what we saw. Right, so if we then draw a line through this and look underneath what's happening, the red is the actin cytoskeleton. The green is the annexin. You can't see membrane, but membrane would be just above the red. And the white dashed line here would be the, where the vitellin membrane is. And what you can see is that annexin B9 is going to this plug region, but it's also reaching out and it's reaching over and touching the plasma membrane. And we can see that actually in, in the scanning EMs. So this is an embryo. There's a wound right here. And if you enlarge it, you can see the plug and the region around it. And to enlarge it more, you can see here's a plug and you can see that it's reaching out and touching the membrane around it. So in terms of looking at the earlier stages when we're asking, how do you plug a wound? How do the vesicles come to the surface? Some of these um, reagents are, are allowing us to, to look at those kind of events as well. Okay, so um, from, from this approach, you're looking at specific things, either specific events that are happening or specific molecules. What we found is that if the pathway that we know exists, calcium goes at least through annexins, rho GEFs, and rho GTPases. So these are responding to these, which are responding to these, which hopefully we'll know soon what they're responding to. Um, the, but it goes then from a very symmetric signal into an asymmetric one. Um, we know that the, the functions of rho GTPases um, are to affect actin ring formation, stability, contraction, and general organization of actin. And one of the, the things that's really nice about this is that we know that there's a difference um, in the fly wound cell, cell wound repair model from that that's been described in Xenopus. Right, so if you remember, I told you for Xenopus, they treadmill. And in, in the fly case, you need to have um, contraction and myosin present. And this is really nice because if in this case, you have two different organisms using the same group of proteins to control the same process, which is wound closure, but by very different mechanisms. And what we want to know is how they're doing that because both of these systems are present in both organisms, yet one chooses one and one chooses another. And the reason that would be important is in a disease state where you, um, like say chronic wounds associated with diabetics, if you were to knock out one pathway and it, it can't function, if you get the other pathway to turn on, since all of the components you need are already there, then you might be able to get wound repair to go forward instead of having chronic wounds. And I think we're getting some um, traction in that because here's a case where we've been able to cause treadmilling to happen in a wound. Um, so we might be able to trigger treadmilling instead of contraction when there's no myosin or that pathway available to close a wound. 
So going back to what we know about cell wound repair in, in all organisms, we have this, these cellular responses that we know happen, um, start, you know, starting from the, bre the breach of the cortex and, and the plugging, the actin rhamycin ring formation, closure and remodeling. Um, and what the fly system is letting us do is have a really nice toolbox to study both from a global viewpoint, what's happening and hopefully be able to give you, us the sort of molecular mechanism that underlies what we see here physiologically, as well as to ask what the role of particular families of proteins like Rho GTPases, RABs or, or nexins are in this process. And so I think we have our work cut out for us for a while and we'll be continuing to do these kind of things. And in this case, when I say we, I just want to um, acknowledge all of the people in the lab that have been working on different aspects of wound healing. Um, we've also had a lot of help for morphometrics analysis, the imaging sort of quantificating, quantif sorry, quantifying our image analysis and bioinformatics. Um, I also need to really acknowledge all of the different community resources that are, that are funded by NIH um, that make this work possible for, for labs of any kind. And of course our funding from NIH. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Susan. That was a truly lovely talk. Thank you. I have already a number of questions in the um, chat, but first let me repeat the CME code for today, 37919. Um, your first question comes regarding the first part of your talk. Uh, Jamie Lachvik would like to um, learn more about the insulin uh, pepta, uh, pathway. And he, she says, we usually think of insulin and insulin-like peptides at long range systemic signaling molecules. Are there conditions within the extracellular space of the embryo that would keep the ILPs highly local to the wound? Um, it's known that the extracellular space is filled with, with extracellular matrix. If you inject a dye into that space, it takes about two minutes for it to completely go around the embryo and become even. So there is a barrier. It doesn't go instantly. Um, you know, in terms of diffusion, but it's not going to be held back very long. Um, for the wounding, I mean, if you're wounding and having a response right away, if the peptide goes out, probably the first receptors that it comes to are going to be the ones that it binds to, depending on its affinity. So it would take longer for it to um, diffuse further away to get to further ones. But so I think there is some restriction because of the extracellular matrix in there, but eventually it should go all the way around the embryo. Uh, to stay with the insulin um, pathway, Aaron Cypus is asking, does reversal of insulin resistance improve wound repair? Um, there are a lot of studies that were done with insulin where they, they took mammalian cells and, and put them in insulin and looked to see what happened. But I think the general thought was that you were somehow making cells fragile and it wasn't just, it, it wasn't insulin signaling per se, but they were fragile. So the kind of analysis they did weren't really looking at insulin, but I think we can go back and do that now because now I think at least in the fly system, it's really clear that it's insulin signaling that's required, not just a secondary effect, but nobody has actually done that yet. It'd be really interesting to find out. Um. Roland Owens is asking, have you looked at wound repair in the presence of bacteria? Um, no, my fly room is really clean. Um, <laughs> um, not intentionally. Uh, <laughs> um, in the early embryo, you don't have an immune response yet. So it wouldn't actually recognize the bacteria as being foreign. You would have to wait till a later stage when it has a, an innate immune system and can recognize the bacteria um, as being something that's not good. So I'm not sure that it would work in our system for that reason, um, but it's a good question. Um, we also have um, uh, cross species questions uh, such as uh, coming from anonymous. Is it known which mechanisms 
Drosophila-like or Xenopus-like is used for cellular wound healing in mammalian cells? Um, that appears to be context dependent. Um, so, so there are cases where it looks like it's treadmilling and there are cases where it looks like it's contractile. Um, and it may be that it matters in what context you're looking in, in all cases. I mean, we've, we've seen that with a number of different um, parameters we've looked at in, in just the fly. Um, it matters, for example, if you wound with a needle or you wound with a laser, you get a different response. Um, so it could be that context is really making a big difference for what mechanism you use. Thank you. Um, Chuck Derolf is asking, from the chip, uh, gene chip analysis not yet examined in details, do you have any other pathways you think may be involved in wound healing? There definitely are associations. If you do bioinformatics and say, you know, what kind of, of hubs do you have? If you look at the 253 genes, we definitely have signaling hubs and cytoskeleton hubs and um, well, actually mostly signaling hubs, but there, there are hubs of different things that are different types of molecules that come up. And we assume that, that there are linked processes based on that. We haven't looked at all of those yet. Um, insulin was our first one, but that's the kind of place we're going to go next, um, for sure. Um, I have a, a bit of a puzzle when I'm thinking about wound healing, especially listening to you. Um, you're describing an army of effectors coming to, to help with the wound healing, and I can see how they will line up at the beginning of the process, but how do they stop what they're doing? Um, that's a good question. So in some cases, it could be the half-life of the protein, like it gets called there, but if it has a half-life of five minutes, maybe it's gone and doesn't get replaced. Um, that would be one way to do it. Um, you could have other complexes come in and take them away. We definitely have, have to have some mechanism of getting rid of the calcium, right? So we can see that the calcium flows in, but it has to go away. Um, so there has to be a mechanism of, of returning it to the perivitalin space. Um, so I assume that there are some type of pumps that can do that. Um, we don't know what those are and we're looking for them. Um, I mean, there, there have to be a number of different things that, you know, from, from physical removal to just wearing out or, or, you know, maybe being somehow modified so they're no longer effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, more questions coming uh, on the chat here. Uh, ben White is asking, you mentioned that at least uh, some of the molecules of cellular wound repair are conserved between xenopus and flies. Is it now when this form of wound repair evolved? Is it an eukaryotic innovation? Um, I'm not aware of any studies where people have actually looked at that to, to know, I mean, to ask what the most ancient time is, um, but at least in, in all of the models that I showed you that people look at, at cell wound repair, the molecules look like they're the same. They're not always used in the same way as I showed you an example where they were two different mechanisms of the same molecules achieving the same goal in the long run. Um, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know that anybody has done a study to know how far back it goes. Um, yeah. um, there are more questions coming. One is uh, a very uh, dear to me, uh, as it comes from Tehi Han, who is a, a staff scientist in my laboratory. <laughs> he's obviously interested in glutamate receptors, and he's asking, are there any glutamate receptors function, especially in the calcium influx, a phenomena that you are uh, describing at the onset of wound healing that are important in here? Um. I know at least one came up in the screen. We've oh. not looked at that. Um, we, we've not looked at that yet um, to see what it does or, or what kind of an effect it has. Um, there are a lot of genes that came up and so we just haven't done them all. But I know at least one glutamate receptor is present in the top hits. I see. And, and I couldn't help um, noticing every time you're describing a wound 
uh, with this amazing collection of GFP trap genes, you're, you had sometimes dots in the middle of the, uh, of the wound, especially that fly trap 74 grid pattern that uh, looked to me like a lot of vesicles um, deploying exocytosing at the same time. Now, I might be completely off and get the wrong idea here in between when you have that wild vesicle release phenomena with providing the membranes and when you see this kind of proteins coming up, but is there any connection? Um, well, one of them is, is a real interesting thing and one is an artifact. <laughs> okay, so um, the, the flytrap 74 I showed you was a real pattern. It comes up in those dots. It's not on the surface, it's actually slightly lower because we're show I showed you a max projection. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when you're wounding with a laser, because it, it wounds in a, in a circle, you get a, if you hit the vitellin membrane, it burns the vitellin membrane and you get a slight grid pattern. If your GFP gene is, is not incredibly bright, one of the artifacts of, of imaging is you can see the grid pattern of the vitellin membrane as a very light pattern on top of the one you're looking at when you do a max projection. And I try to remove the, the slice that has the vitellin membrane when I do that, but I clearly missed one <laughs> because, uh, so, so sometimes when you see that really, really faint pattern, it just is from the, the laser hitting the, the vitellin membrane and not quite being as low as it needed to be. But the, the flytrap one I showed you where it was a very strong pattern, that is a GFP pattern and it, it's consistent. Every embryo will show that. And it, it seems to come up in a grid pattern and eventually coalesce into uh, another pattern. And those are uh, very interesting findings to look forward in the near future because <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely, um, the charm by that kind of a beauty when you're closing those <laughs> wounds. <laughs> exactly. No, we got all kinds of patterns. Well, most, I mean, I showed you a lot of actin rings and halos. We did get some like the, the flytrap 74 where it's a very specific subset of dots or, or regions that are, are um, coming up. And so far, we don't know everything that they correspond to. Um. Um, if there are no more questions, then um, I would like to thank you. Once again, um, I know my voice does not represent the hundreds that are on this call so that enjoyed your stories. And thank you very much for um, being with us today, Susan, and uh, for teaching us so much about wound healing. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about our work.